Discussions in Depth Psychology is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. Your host is Bonnie Bright. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussions in Depth Psychology. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and Discussions in Depth Psychology is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. And most of you know who are following this series that this series is really intended to introduce you to some of the people that are doing really amazing work in the field of depth psychology. And I have with me today my guest, Dr. Mary Harrell. Mary is a Jungian-oriented psychotherapist and also an author, and we'll be discussing her book, Imaginal Figures in Everyday Life, Stories from the World between matter and mind. Well, Mary, thanks so much for being with me. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, Bonnie. I appreciate it. So let me just tell everybody a little bit about Mary, and then we'll jump right into the questions. Mary H. Harrell is the author of the new book, Imaginal Figures in Everyday Life, Stories from the World Between Matter and Mind. And this book comes as a result of research, personal experience, and professional accomplishments in the area of union oriented psychotherapy. Dr. Harrell, who is a licensed psychologist, earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute and her Master's of Arts in Education in Developmental Reading from University of Delaware. And she's Associate Professor Emeritus at State University of New York at Oswego Curriculum and Instruction Department School of Education. Um, Mary also served as a K-12 teacher and a reading specialist for three decades. And she, again, as I mentioned, she is the author of Imaginal Figures in Everyday Life, Stories from the World Between Matter and Mind. And you can learn more about her at maryharrellphd.com. And so, Mary, uh, you know, it's really exciting to have your book on hand. And, and this is a topic that I think is probably really powerfully exciting to anybody who has some kind of understanding or passion for depth psychology. It really, for me, is at the core of what depth psychology is. And that, of course, is engaging with the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you'll just start by talking about something that you refer to in the book. And this is a really core idea for me, but it has not always been a core idea for me before I knew anything about depth psychology. This might have spoken to me, but it wasn't necessarily something that I really thought about. And that is the idea that in the book you refer to the image-making capacity of soul. Mm -hmm. so can you launch us and talk a little bit about what you mean when you say that? Okay. Yeah, that, that brings a smile to my face <clears throat> because soul, which all of us in depth psychology, we appreciate soul. We know Oh, that a big piece of soul is in the unconscious realm. But the language of soul is symbol. And symbol shows itself in image. So we will see dream images. We all know the images that we hold dear from fairy tales and myth. Even in modern art making, a film will have images that people cannot get out of their head. And so these images that grab us, whether they're dream images, art images, images from myth, this is all soul kind of manifesting in a way that people can understand. So this image making capacity of soul is so critical. Without that capacity, we cannot talk with soul, so we can't come to terms with the unconscious. And isn't that what we need for transformation? Indeed. So I'd like to start out by talking about what inspired you to write the book. But what brought me specifically to the work is that when I was 13 years old, my mother died. And when she died, she died in childbirth. And so nobody expected her death. And when she died, she left seven children from the age of 16 to two hours old. So you can imagine that we were all in a state of profound grief for years because the mother is the soul of the family. And um, I particularly, because I've always been intuitive and I've always been very inward leaning and I've always been very spiritual, um, I was so very lost. And I'm not suggesting my brothers and sisters were not, they were. But two years after my mother's death, a figure came into my bedroom, a woman. and she literally moved from becoming a non-corporeal presence, which I knew where she was and that she was there, but I couldn't see her, to becoming a corporeal being. And so as her 
her face, her clothing, her gestures became clear. She was walking to me and she wanted to hand me a box. And that box was a gift and she was very kind, but I was just 15. So I, I was terrified. And I did everything in my power to stop this thing from happening. So I intuitively knew that my sister who was in the same bedroom, I didn't use these words, but I knew she, she had a body. And if I could jump out of bed and just put my arms around her, I felt that I could make that lady stop coming. And so I did that and she disappeared. Well, I, I was raised a Catholic and we at that time, now Catholics believe in the, um, the body of saints and we believe in a lot of symbolism and sacramental imagination. But we were never encouraged to talk about ghosts. And so I never talked about this with anybody. But that woman continued to reappear to me for 22 years. And for 22 years, I did everything in my power to kind of head her off at the past. I didn't know at the time that what I was doing was altering my consciousness. So if you turn on lights, if you put your arms around your husband, which like in my 20s, that's what I would do. All of this kind of woke me up from that altered state of consciousness and therefore the woman stopped manifesting. But I didn't talk about it because people can say, oh, there's a troubled girl. So I knew not to, you know, talk about that. But years later, the second big piece of this story is that I went to Pacifica and I was in my 40s when I went there. And you know, as a Pacifica graduate yourself, that you see that there's a lens called analytical psychology which allows you to look at these symbolic happenings and these happenings that are not of the rational world. Uh, at Pacifica, I learned that analytical psychology allows us to kind of investigate these things with a sense of reality and scholarship that the rest of the world doesn't really fully talk about. So I finally saw that I wasn't alone and because I had that very profound experience and others, but that was the big one, I knew that I wanted to spend my professional life studying about these imaginal beings. Because they're very real, they're just not fully um, of the physical world and they're not fully of the mind. They live in that realm between matter and mind, which Henri Corbin and Hellman and others have called the mundus imaginalis. And I kind of think of that as you get into that realm by allowing an altered state of consciousness. Mary, that, that's such a, a profound and dramatic experience to have suffered the loss of your mother in that way. And of course, you mentioned that she was the soul of the family. And a lot of us as teenagers, let alone adults who have suffered this kind of trauma in our lives, don't really have containers in which to allow this kind of experience, as you call it, an altered state of consciousness to really unfold, or we are so often frightened by what's happening that we do turn to techniques and ways to cope with what's happening that often turns, kind of turns that switch off, I think, and mm -hmm. enables us to go about living more normal lives, but, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, sort of turns off that soulful piece of us that is really wishing to come forward and be addressed and engaged with. And mm -hmm. my own experience, as you mentioned at Pacifica, was really that it became a container for those kinds of experiences mm -hmm. that I was having, and I suspect many people are having, and just don't quite know what to do with because as we begin to individuate as you can call it and to really find ourselves and to engage with soul then these sorts of things start coming forward for us to be able to give us experiences that we can deal with can you talk a little bit about what it was at Pacifica that enabled you to actually pick up the threads of this book which you had written many years earlier and begin to weave that into the book that it has become today in which you're able to talk about these ideas so clearly Mm -hmm. Yes, um, my book has seven stories, and some of those stories I wrote before I ever went to Pacifica. So the story of the angel visiting me, I wrote that years before I went to Pacifica, and there was 
story of school shootings. I think I wrote that while I was at Pacifica. There was a story about my Aunt Tina that I wrote many years before I went to Pacifica. And I, I sent those stories to a, an agent. And he read the stories, and he had other, another person read the stories. And they both said, you have a book here, but you have to find a way to make it universal and to, to open it to the experiences of many others in a very direct way. So flash forward, I found myself at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And lo and behold, there I found a framework, a way of looking at my experiences that could actually deepen the experiences that I had had prior to that. So, for instance, when, when that angel visited me for 22 years, I learned at Pacifica that there's this idea called an archetype an archetype of the orphan. And of course, we know that an archetype means this is a pattern of experience that many humans have. And so what I learned is, at Pacifica, if there's an archetype like the orphan, that means that there's a material end of that archetype, in this case, me, and that there's a spiritual end of the archetype, or a spirit end, which would have been the, how, how can I say it? what became the angel that visited me. But remember I said before she manifested, I knew she was there? Well, I could feel her spirit. Mm. Well, the image-making capacity of soul allowed me to actually kind of fill in the spaces. In other words, the spirit was a spirit under the orphan archetype, and she was in that room, but she kind of looked like a Madonna. But where would, I, where would a person get the image of a Madonna but from a faith tradition? And she had a box for me. Well, I found out many, many years later that my image-making capacity of soul created that box. And in that box, I could make the association with the gifts a mother would give her child. Mm -hmm. So I learned at Pacifica that there are these ideas of archetypes floating around. There's the archetype of the father, the mother, the angel, the gambler, the sensual goddess. And I learned at Pacifica that each individual experiences the archetypes in an infinite number of different ways. And I didn't know that before I went there. So I started looking at these stories, which were very rich, and they really resonated with me. That's, by the way, how you know that you're not making something up. There's this deep aha feeling that you can get to recognize. And when you feel that, it's a visceral feeling in the body. And it says to you, there's something here. Pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I knew that those, I wrote many stories, but I knew that those seven held visionary encounters and that if I could look at them, I could, I could kind of split a veil between worlds and make sense out of them, at least for those people who were open to this realm. Absolutely. Since 1685 until the beginning of the 1800s, yeah, like 1815, we had what we call the Age of Enlightenment. And during that period of time, a new paradigm opened. And if you know Robert Romanish, and I know you do, he understands that paradigm, and he introduced me to it. And in that paradigm, science became the great arbiter of legitimacy. So if we could look at something objectively through the lens of science and reproduce it and study it and sadly objectify it, we could then say that's a legitimate experience. So from the Age of Enlightenment until today, uh, this new model of reality exists. And if you experience something, or I do, or my neighbor does, or somebody I know does, if it doesn't fit in that model of scientific reality, then it's often cast aside as being something we quote unquote made up. And so when I talk to people about my book, and I talk, for instance, about the angel who visited me, Almost always, somebody says something like this. You know, when my mother died, this person would say, she was in Florida, I was in South Carolina. And when her body was being taken from 
Florida to South Carolina, I worried and fretted over how these others would have dressed her. And would she like it and would she be pleased? And I wish I could have done that. People tell me stories like this. And they'll say, the night before my mother's body arrived, she appeared to me in my bedroom. And she was dressed in this beautiful white suit. And she looked at me and she said, it all worked out fine. And what do you think happened the next day? The woman saw her mother in the funeral home in the same outfit that she never saw before. And people tell me these stories all the time. And I say to them, don't discount them because they don't fit in the model of reality that most people live by. And I kind of say that to you too. If you're willing to say, my, my arbiter isn't science, but my arbiter is, did I experience it? So if you experience anything and you're functioning well, you're going to meetings, you're going to work, you're fulfilling your obligations, you're sleeping at night, then you, you're not crazy. You're not making it up. You're just experiencing something from a realm that lives somewhere on that cusp between conscious and unconscious living. And of course, that always comes from the unconscious, just like dreams do. Yeah, very true. And you're touching into something that, again, I, I just had this sort of thread that keeps coming back to me or as I listen to you speak is occurring to me very strongly. And that is that everybody has an inner life of some sort. And this idea that science is an arbiter, I mean, science is a big word and, and we can use that between us and understand it. But of course, that includes so many different kinds of things that we encounter in our everyday lives that are not imaginal figures to, to make kind of a wordplay on, on the title of your book. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, you know, even just now as we're sitting here, I'm thinking about technology. I'm thinking about the internet. I'm thinking about so many things that we do on a daily basis that are based on rational decisions, um, time management, you know having to be one place and not another place, things that are not necessarily reflective, things that are not necessarily soulful. And yet, um, all again, all of this is coming through, all of this soulful kind of experience is coming through for us all the time. It's just that often we, and maybe I should speak for myself, but we sort of tend to push that away or set it aside or say maybe later or not at all or whatever that is. And, and again, whether it's a, an experience of encountering a spirit of someone who has passed away or whether it's simply ideas or thoughts or images that occur to us or whether it's our dreams like our nighttime dreams as mm -hmm. depth psychologists we have sort of an obligation to to pursue those things and to really dig into them and reflect on them and allow time for those and mm -hmm. to make it a daily practice of in fact engaging with those things so you're a graduate of the clinical program at pacifica mm -hmm. and i know that you have gone on to make practice of being a depth oriented or union oriented psychotherapist mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about what that process is of actually engaging with clients and maybe you know I, I'm sure you start someplace different with every one of them and it probably varies greatly but but in the end you might agree with me that what you're really doing is helping them to create more of a richer inner life and to begin to pay attention to some kind, some of those messages and experiences that are coming through. Can you talk about your experience of that, about developing that practice and how rewarding that has been both for you and for your family? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, first of all, we have to understand that everybody who comes to us in psychotherapy is not at the same place. And so some people, absolutely, who come to me have very little or no ego development because of maybe how they were raised. Often that's the case or trauma they've gone through. And so we know in depth psychology that there, there's a particular structure of the psyche. So there's the ego and there's the persona and there's the anima or the animus and there's the self. And so... <clears throat> These things are developmental. So if I have a person and I could just tell by everything we talk about or everything they bring to the session that they really need to develop ego strength, then I might not go into this depth perspective with them. I, I always try to make an invitation. 
And an invitation, for instance, would be me saying to a client, you know, you've talked a lot about your relationship in your immediate family and that I'm making this up and that you're marginalized in your family. Have you had any dreams that speak to this? And then I listen to their response. And I might say something like, would you be willing to just keep a journal of your dreams because you and I are speaking consciously, but our unconscious parts of self are also talking to each other in this session. So would you be willing to just keep an eye on your dreams between this session and the next and write them down for me and we'll see if psyche is weighing in. And I'll use that term a lot. So depending on what happens after I make those kinds of invitations, some people might be frightened to hear me go to the world of dreams, being very clear in their own mind that it's not a real place. And so I don't push it. I really honor where the clients are. But when I get somebody, not always, but often a bit more mature, a person who really knows in terms of their their life's work and their place in their own family and their place in the world, they have an identity that's pretty well established and they have a strong ego. Those people usually take to inner work and more depth oriented work like a fish to water. So they kind of give me the clues of how far I can go. And believe me, I keep giving these little nudges, these little invitations because I know that there's so much richness there available to them if they're willing and able to take advantage of that. Mm. Yeah. You know, and for those clients who stay a long time, it always comes. It always comes. Right. An opportunity to do the deeper work. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because you're able to hold a container so that people can actually allow that soul to come through, which is something I think that I was referring to earlier when we go about our everyday stuff that's Mm. really governed by the rational thinking and the, you know, the day-to-day things, Mm -hmm. we don't make that container for ourselves. And we do need often somebody that can do that for us and for you to be able to pursue your own calling and, and go forward and become a therapist that can actually create that container. You're doing Mm -hmm. some really powerful work in the world. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm so appreciative of people that are doing that because it's not something that I necessarily feel I can do myself. My orientations have been far more toward um, sort of looking at our culture and understanding what's wrong with our culture. But of course the culture Mm -hmm. starts with the individual. So Mm -hmm. I'm kind of going in circles, um, back and forth between those things, but it's, it's circumambulating or, or going around something that mm-hmm. I think is also very powerful, and maybe we can kind of close on this, and that is that Robert Ramanishan, whom you mentioned earlier, and is a very mm-hmm. amazing depth psychologist in his own right, and a clinician as well, he referred to what you're doing here with the imaginal work and the imaginal figures in everyday life as a mm-hmm. therapy of culture. Can you just say a few words about that and and how that actually can be applied to our culture as well as to individuals? Yeah. As a depth psychologist, I'm very aware that there's an individual psychology, which is very important, but there's a cultural psychology. As a teacher, I was a teacher for 30 years before I started practicing full time. I can see a collective culture in school settings, for instance. And you can't pay attention to your own individual integrity, development, liminal experiences, dreams, without also becoming open to those things as they manifest in the culture. And so Robert Romanishan talked about that when I wrote my stories and then kind of worked them meaning went into the imaginal realm to kind of see what was there, he noticed that the language I used was language that held a deep poetic sensibility. Well, if you look at the world as a poet instead of a quote-unquote psychologist, then you're looking at everything that happens in the world through a lens of the humanities. And so, for instance, as a teacher, I was and am really devastated by the series of school shootings, which doesn't stop. We haven't heard anything lately because school's been out. So I was able to look with a poetic sensibility at that 
very real phenomenon as a cultural dream. And so the question I asked is, if this is a cultural dream, because we always have to wonder, you don't want to say it is, you want to say if it's a cultural dream, then I wonder what the psyche is saying about the collective. And then you have to say, well, what collective? And I, what, what came up with, with creating the same associations for the culture, in, in my case, I was looking at the nation, and I was looking at a shadow figure that could be very enraged and very volatile and very um, homicidal. Not just individual young boy shooters, but what in the culture might be contributing to this series of shootings? And what, what appeared was this entity, an imaginal figure called national violence. And that came from looking not at my own dream life, but the dream of the culture. So I think that was one of the things Dr. Ramanishan was, was alluding to, that I could think about the world and think about and talk about the world with this poetic sensibility. But I think he was also suggesting that if we, if we kind of look at a phenomenon that occurs with this notion of wondering and mystery and kind of a wish to go deeper into the experience that we can actually change the world just as, you know, I went to Pacific in January and I was amazed and excited at a turn that I believe Pacifica has made. And this is a turn that, that really looks toward action in the world to change the ecological trajectory, to change social injustice trajectories. And I saw that and I loved it. I think it's really wonderful. But I also believe what Jung told us, which is if, if each individual can really hold a container for themselves in which they honestly look at negative aspects of self, they honestly look at shadow aspects of self, they, all, they require of themselves a certain integrity, that they start, I mean, these are not Jung's words, but what I got from Jung is that out of them comes this ripple effect, a stability, a capacity just by being in the room to create a container. People can feel you when you're that way. So I think that's what Dr. Romanishan was talking about, that to look at psychotherapy in this way with a poetic sensibility and an acknowledgement of the things that exist in this middle realm, which is where that dream about school shootings really kind of coalesced in this middle realm for me. He says that the culture itself can benefit, not just individuals. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's not what he meant, but I think that's what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that sounds really realistic. And of course, you're reminding me that James Hillman said, and I think you mentioned this somewhere in your book, that it's about utilizing the organ of the imagination in the healing process. Mm -hmm. And so it's bringing that natural capacity that we all have. And of course, there are tons of techniques and ways to do that. And that's the one thing about deaf psychology that I never understood or, or knew about until I actually kind of found deaf psychology, or I should say it found me, I guess, quite late in my life, I feel. But that is that there are actually formal techniques like Jung's use of active imagination to engage the imaginal, to engage these figures, dream work. Um, there are so many different ways, somatic work, art therapy. And of course, all of these are accessible to all of us all the time, but it's mostly about finding that vehicle of the imagination so that we can use the, the organ of the imagination, as Hillman said, and begin to create these profound kind of changes. And as you say, be able to actually actively start taking this out into the world. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a process there. You know, it takes a lot of time sometimes of one working on themselves before you ever maybe feel like you're to the point where you want to take it out into the world. But that's a very natural process, I think, that goes about. And where do you want to wait until you're done working on yourself before right. you bring things out into the world, which is why I'm so thrilled about the direction I see Pacifica moving in right now. You don't have to wait until you've got everything in place and you're fully individuated. You can start today. And we all have, the work you do is bringing 
messages to many and organizing people so that they can talk to each other and develop ideas. And I think you've created a container in depth psychology alliance. That's another way to be a container and hold a container. Mm -hmm. But I've learned in my life that I can be satisfied if I do my small piece. And I don't have to, as I did when I was a young girl, look at all these people doing wonderful things and say, oh, I should be doing that and I should be doing that. No, we kind of each have a part to play. And I, I, I want to say that I've noticed in my own life, if my active imagination is the only thing you and I have been talking about the whole time, that's what this is. And we know when, when Jung was a young man and he broke with Freud, he spent years involved with those stones. We hear the story about him building with stones. And when he played with stones, images came to him, thoughts came to him, we know from his, book, his memoir. And he did that for years. And out of that, he realized that that was a process that he discovered. And he called that process active imagination. And the thing he says that I have taken to heart, and it kind of guides me when I'm deciding how far to go with an imaginal experience, he says, stay with the image, and it could take seconds or years, and look at that image with a self-reflective ego attitude until you come to terms with the unconscious. And that's what I do, and that's what I think we all do when we're moving toward, let's call it the light. You know, I'm just saying the light. I don't know how else to describe it, but getting to a place where there's more goodness in the world, where there's more community in the world, where there's more understanding in the world, or there's less social injustice in the world. And so I think that for me, I've learned that from Jung and Hillman, and then later Veronica Goodchild and Robert Romanishan, and I'm so grateful. They were wonderful. They were, I'll never forget those two, especially the last two that I said, Robert and Veronica. When I was writing my dissertation, Veronica was very... Um, she read my abstract and she agreed to be my advisor. But I was very green and, and I read other people's dissertations and I thought I was supposed to write like them. So I would start writing these theoretical things and Veronica would just say, I can't accept this. This isn't what you said you were going to do. And I would say, well, what did I say I was going to do? And, and she would say, oh, and back in the unconscious, didn't it? And she would ask me to read my dissertation proposal. And she helped me bring this stuff out of the unconscious. And now I do it pretty regularly. So I'm very grateful to Veronica and very grateful to Robert. They, they, were, they were really brilliant and tender teachers. And they, they, wouldn't, they really wouldn't let go of me until I got it. And they always had faith in me. So I love them. I love them both. Yeah, I, I have a very um, similar experience. And of course, that's one thing that I really am grateful for my own Pacifica experience is that just the amazing quality of people who are there and the access to some of these profound pioneers in the field. Mm -hmm. They're doing really such wonderful work. Mm -hmm. so. You know, you, you did just to finish, I mean, I'll just finish the thought if I can. You had started by saying, you know, how do you know when something that emerges from your imagination is something you should go with or something you could trust. And it's so interesting, when I first came to Pacifica, um, I was at a time of my life of extreme transition. And it was really a very difficult time. And I just was called there, like so many people who go there. And my intuitive response to the faculty was that these were special people who had tremendous courage, but not in the sense of like the, the, um, the warrior that we see in mythology. Their, their forward action in the world was that they were doing things that many in the rest of the world were not doing and maybe not acknowledging. And they, I could tell that they, they had some connection with something deep within them. And they were following that. And I have never seen that before. And they created a container. And I think that's what many Pacifica students have, the experience of that container. It doesn't mean people don't get mad and there aren't fusses and there aren't, you know, 
mess ups. I mean, that happens in any organization. But I felt that the school itself, from Dr. Eisenstadt all the way down, seemed to collect people who could participate in this holding process so that each one of us would not become little Jungs or little James Hillmans or little Robert Romanishkins, but each one of us could really grow, not up into our maturity, but down into the depths of our maturity. That's beautiful, Mary. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I think it's really important that, that everyone understand just how special it is to be able to surround one's self with this kind of material and whether or not you you know you formally are able to go and, and do a graduate program in depth psychology somewhere or to just immerse yourself in the public programs that are available and a lot of these kinds of this kind of material it's it's really important there's something that everybody can do to begin to open themselves to that kind of soulful reflection and mm -hmm. and imagination so it's really wonderful the work that you're doing mary i so appreciate it and uh, just really wish you lots of luck i've been speaking today with dr mary harrell who is a depth oriented psychotherapist and an author of the book imaginal figures in everyday life and you can learn more about mary at her website and that's mary harrell spelled h-a-r-r-e-l-l -L, mary harrell phd.com and Mary, uh, you also have a website where you offer sessions for people who would like to experience some of this kind of work, and that's at MaryHarrellPsychologist.com. So Mary, thank you again so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Discussions in Depth Psychology, powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute with host Bonnie Bright.